Grand Rising, everyone. Grand Rising. I am uh, so glad to be with you here this morning. Wow, the sun is shining. Woo! <laughs> I have missed it so much. <laughs> it has been a little overcast, too much for my liking lately. Um, and to see the sun before 2 o'clock is just amazing. So, um, And thank you for being here. I don't know about you. I might have had a tough choice. Should I go out and do something in the sun, or should I come here and hang out with my beloved spiritual family? And so I am, I am actually very glad to be here with you here today. We are... Um, following this wonderful theme about grand rising, the idea that it's not just about getting up in the morning, but that each day we have an opportunity to really experience a grand rising as we move about our day, as we begin to start our day and move out into the world, and to take that beautiful, powerful, positive energy out into the world. This month, we're talking about good to great, to grand, and we've been looking at the idea about what it takes for us to experience that good, to great, to grand. In the week one, we had our beloved Reverend Karen up here on the platform, and she talked about that inner awareness of our inner landscape. She gave us some great tools to consider as we were raising our awareness to what's inside of us, what we're thinking, and to be curious, and uh, I believe it was observation, curiosity, and discovery, not necessarily in that order. Um, but that all three of those tools can really help us to pay attention and to be mindful. Like, uh, boy, a piece of chocolate, ask a child to put a piece of chocolate in. I'm going to use that in an adult class. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I, boy, that is that is beautiful. That's really a beautiful example. I appreciate that. And, of course, we're all going to steal it, including the people who are listening to the recording, because it's a great exercise. Um, last week, I talked about our values, the, the things that we care about, and how living a value-led life was really important to moving us from that good to great to grand. And... Today, the talk title is The Steps We Take. The Steps We Take. So I'm sorry to disappoint the note takers, but I'm not going to enumerate a bunch of steps for you today. <laughs> but I am going to talk a little bit about our teaching and this philosophy and this idea that this teaching was created, um, or should I say revealed, by Dr. Ernest Holmes about 100 years ago. And he... He actually is a synthesizer. So many of you who um, know who Dr. Holmes is, he, he uh, started, this, he founded this movement, but he was influenced by a number of New Thought thinkers. And when I think about the, how this teaching first showed up through Dr. Holmes, through Emma Curtis Hopkins, through Emerson, um, for me what came up was this, idea of self-realization. Self-realization. And in this day and age when there is so much need on the planet, self-realization can sound a little selfish, right? Like navel-gazing when there's all this urgency around, the, around us when we uh, look at the discord and the the people who are fighting each other right here in our home or overseas. So why would self-realization be important? I read a, a quote this week that, you know, when it happens, you hear truth and something in you just vibrates, right? So I, I read this and I immediately recognized it as truth. People who truly love themselves do not become destructively self-centered. They do not abuse others. They do not stop growing or changing. People who love themselves well learn to love others well. They continually grow into healthier people, learning that their love is appropriately placed. Man, I love that quote. <laughs> 
I liked it because it really talked about the true essence of self-love. Not self-love so that I'm going to, you know, take care of me and the heck with you, get out of my way, but a deep self-love where I am so centered in the knowing of who I am and my authenticity and my truth that there's love that is overflowing out into the world from my heart and from my beingness and the way I treat people and the way I think. And I think self-love, if, you know, I was, I was looking at culture, right? Looking at the t kind of the timeline. There, I couldn't find a timeline for self-love, but it seems that the first time that it became to, it started to bubble up in our culture was in the late 1890s with William James, who wrote this amazing uh, book about the principles of psychology where he began to talk about our thinking and our behavior. And he framed it in stream of con consciousness and emotion and our behavior as habit and will. And it was probably one of the first times that that was really discussed at a macro level in our culture to begin to look at the, our humanity and the way that we are and, the, and, and that we could actually use our thinking and our actions to self-actualize, to self-realize, to begin to have a greater sense of the amazing human beings that we are. Now, I think we come to this, uh, what I would say is a kind of mass cultural belief in North America, um, uh, honestly. You know, there's this, this idea that, you know, unworthiness or I'm not enough or who am I to think that, you know, I should deserve anything. And then on the opposite end of that continuum, sometimes we find the, the, what I'll call the hollow self-love, right? Where, oh, well, if I get enough, I'll be enough. If I can get this for myself, then, then maybe I'll be okay. And somewhere in the center is this, what I would call, holistic, beautiful, grounded self-love where we know who we are, or as Kathy likes to say, whose we are. We know that we are indeed div divinity in form, that the, the universe and the creative life force that, that has so much love, and I don't mean the romantic love or the love when I say I love ice cream and chocolate, but that divine love that wants to experience itself creates. And it doesn't create by some magic, you know, Santa Claus, God in the sky with a long beard and a chair and in a chair and, you know, granting goodness to, in, you know, discriminant people who have behaved. No, it, the, the love that I'm talking about is the, the self-actualization of itself as creation. And so it creates life by means of you and I. If we, if we are, you know, looking for some granddaddy in the sky who's going to work miracles in our life, stop wasting your time. That's not how it works. There is, there is no divine puppet master who is going to pull the right strings for you because you did the incantation perfectly and, you know, stood on the north or the south. No, the... Life that we are longing and yearning for comes from and starts with a deep sense of self-love, where we recognize ourselves as divinity in form. We recognize that when we do those simple things in life, those simple actions that are born of consciousness, those ideas that come to us, when we are grounded in our authenticity, and then we think to ourselves, I'm going to give so-and-so a call. Or, it feels right to do X, Y, Z. We are divinely guided through that self-love that we get in touch with. And it lives in each one of you. There is there's no person on this planet 
that doesn't have access to this deep self-love that is grounded in the very power that created all life. I like to call it the thing that makes the grass grow. You know, and when I think about humanity and divinity and how we are connected, I, I you know, there, we have been um, domesticated, if you will, by some traditional religions to think of, you know, spirituality's over here, and I'm over here, and I'm going to try to be spiritual. You can't be any more spiritual than you are right now. It's just about allowing it. It's about recognizing it. It's about giving yourself space to be who you truly are. Oh boy, I have deviated from my talk notes this morning. <laughs> um, you know, as we look at this idea of self-love, the, the tricky part that I think we have to navigate is that we're wired for survival, right? You know, if you think about the fact that the, what I would say is the self-compassion or the self-love movement is probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 60 years old. Yeah, the 60s were 80 years ago. <laughs> Holy cow. So, no, 40, 20, 60 years ago. <laughs> yes, I was an accountant in a former life, but uh, <laughs> I used spreadsheets and a calculator. <laughs> 60 years ago. You know, it's a thing where you say, wait, that doesn't make sense. Wait a minute. So, so when you think about this, this movement of self-realization and actualization, it's really young compared to the whole, like, timeline of humanity. Like, it's a blink. <laughs> it's, it's so young. It's like, you know, it's, it's like as small as a hair. I don't even think there's a measurement to it when you think about how long humans have walked the planet. And so this idea of self-love and understanding how we can begin to love ourselves and then therefore create a world that works for everyone through the idea that when we are really grounded in self-love, it is so easy to love the other to love someone else, to love that person that might feel differently t than you. Um, yeah, like, you know, I saw a bumper sticker on a car today, and I'm not going to say what it said. All I can say is my first instinct was, ew. <laughs> and my next instinct is, ah, God in form takes so many different uh, expressions. It really does. Um, one of the things that I f was thinking about this morning was this idea that sometimes it's easy for us to just go to sleep to the mass messaging that we get from commercials and advertising. You know, uh, you probably know this already because you're all really smart individuals, but the real core of ag advertising is to try to convince you that you're not enough and you need a product that they have to sell. And if you think about, I don't know, like it's, it's not Super Bowl time of year, but if you think about the commercials that you really enjoyed during the Super Bowl, they weren't telling you you weren't enough. They were reminding you of beauty or joy or something wonderful that opened your heart. And so this, this, these steps to beginning to go from good to great to grand are really simple. We align ourselves. We talked about values last week. So we align ourselves to values and principles that resonate within us. And then we set an intention. We use our marvelous consciousness and our brains to set a course for ourselves. We begin to uh, use that, the powers of our thinking to set an intention to point us in a direction that is, um, that is really supported by our passion and our values. And then we take action. Uh, the way I, I was reading Emma Curtis Hopkins this week, and it's really stuck in my head, so maybe I do have a little bit of enumeration for you. She said that the way that we really embody 
our values or principles, the things that are important to us, the way we really embody it is that first we think it, then we speak it, then we write it, and then we find we're living in it. We think it, we speak it, we write it, and then we're living it. And I love that because there are so simple things that I can do. Like when I have a knee-jerk reaction to somebody or someone, I can go back to what it is that I know, that there is only one and that we, are, we, are, that we have this beautiful free will to express the divinity in so many ways, some ways I like, some ways I don't like. And then I move my intention to my values and what are the things that I want to see in the world. And it isn't about trying to convince you to think like me. No. It's about respecting you for who you are because I have this thing called self-love because I respect who I am. I don't have to change you. I just have to find that sweet spot where we can be together. And then taking those actions, that's the, that's the part that's really cool. Like there's, I don't know about you, but when I do spiritual practice there, I, I have little, it's like little whispers. It's the more I do my meditation, my spiritual practice, the louder the little spiritual nuggets are that I hear in the back of my mind, little instructions, if you will, that seem to bubble up from that self-love that I've been cultivating. And so I do my spiritual practice, I take classes, I do those things to help my thinking be in the direction of my values and the principles that are important to me. It's not complicated, right? Is it easy? No. <laughs> it's, not, it's not so easy. I, you know, I, I show up in rooms like this. In, with groups that are, are doing the same work of cultivating self-love. Of I read things like the Science of Mind textbook, um, Science of Mind textbook and the Science of Mind magazine. This, um, this morning's reading, I bumped into a number of tem tender people this morning, and I thought about this reading today for May 19th, and I thought I would share it with you. Create soft landings. I'll just share a little bit of it with you. I believe the telling, that telling our stories first to ourselves and then to one another and the world is a revolutionary act. That's the quote. And it says, to be alive on this planet is to feel loss at some point or another. Each day we are called to integrate the experience of everything that has come before, some of which we may label wonderful and amazing, and some of which we may label, I would rather have that have not happened. We only have to tune into the world around us to realize this is the truth of our individual and collective experience. Wouldn't it be great if we had a formula we could plug in and bypass the pain and challenges that arise in our lives? Unfortunately, such is not the case. What I know, probably more clearly than I've ever known before, is the healing power of community. The healing power of community, the healing power of creating safe spaces for us to feel our feelings till they complete. The healing power of being in a place where we can support each other when I'm on, you know, doing okay and maybe you're struggling a little bit. That's why I love things like classes when you can bring people together to really dive deep into our philosophy. We just completed the um, Power of Decision class by Raymond Charles Barker. This was the first class that I took, and I think this was the third time that I've taught it. And each time that I have moved through this material, it has reminded me of this perfect divine walk between our humanity and our divinity. That we don't just, you know, this isn't um, a teaching where we just, you know, think about unicorns and rainbows and everything's going to be okay. It doesn't work that way. It's, it feels good, doesn't it? It feels good to think about unicorns and rainbows, but that's not real life. There was a quote by Ernest Holmes, 
that I want to share with you. And he says, the ultimate goal of life does not mean that we shall ever arrive at a spiritual destination where everything remains static and inactive. That which, to our present understanding, seems an ultimate goal will, when attained, be but the starting point for a new and further evolution. We are always working. It isn't about moving in a circle. It's about being in a spiral. And as we do our spiritual practice and growth and working in classes, what we find is that sometimes as we move in this spiral ever upward, evolving our own consciousness, that sometimes we, we hit these little snags and they, they come up again. And it's like, wait a minute, I thought I healed that. The reason people take classes, the reason they really... Uh, dive into this philosophy and are so active with it is because they know that the tools to, when that, they hit that snag, that thing that keeps coming up for them, they hit that snag, the classes are going to give them tools to move through that in a way that is really supportive. And we find that the healing or the movement through it becomes quicker. There is a quickening as we move through these classes. And so... Um, I want to thank those who just took the class. And Mary, if you could put that slide up for us. These are all the beautiful individuals who took this class. If you're here in the room, would you please stand? I want to acknowledge you as our students. Thank you. Look around you. These are the people you should talk to if you're curious about classes. And then I have a ready camera. I have asked Jen Stackpole to come up and just give us about three minutes of her experience in class. Thank you. Um, well, I, oh, I the class was brilliant. So power of decision, right? Um, talking about knowing that we are at choice. Uh, the class, first of all, it, imagine if you will, what we get here on Sundays, this feeling of community and camaraderie and learning the, the principles and the message that we have here and utilizing that through an eight-week course where week after week you get to connect with other people that are in this philosophy. And not only do you get to connect and be supported and go on this beautiful journey together, but you get practical tools where you can utilize and apply them in your daily life. So this class, when we started eight weeks ago, I was a different human being. I thought differently, I felt differently, and although I was familiar with the teachings and, and the principles, this gave me a whole brand new way of being able to apply it. And thankfully, as Dr. Alice was talking about the snag, <laughs> I have gone through that very thing, and, and especially recently, um, even over the last few days, and that, that, that challenge of feeling that snag and feeling that spiral of going, I thought I healed this, and here it is. What we went through in that class together gave me the ability to stand in a truth that I didn't know was there or available. And knowing that I have support with my fellow classmates and spiritual community has made all of the difference because then I can show up just as me, crying as it is, emotional, whatever it is, and I can feel that support. And the class not only helped me with an intellectual understanding of the principles and the philosophies and all of that's great, but it's also helped me integrate it in a way. So now it's becoming automatic. So this morning when I wanted to curl up and just roll over and go back to bed, I got up, I got ready, I came, because I knew that this is where I belong and this is home because this is my spiritual community and my family and I knew I was going to see people that I went to class with and people that I really connect with. So these classes are really a way of, again, not just to intellectualize and have great concepts and go, well, that makes a lot of sense, that's cool, but it's ways to actually really integrate it and apply it and do it in such a safe container where people are brave and courageous and deeply sharing and you go on this journey together where you just really connect and it just starts to become so much a part of who you are you don't have to think about it anymore and that I would say if you're even close to considering it don't hesitate just sign up for just sign up for one and see that's what I did I was like well, this seems kind of cool maybe I'll check it out I've heard it's pretty transformative let me see what comes of it so and I have to agree, it's been the most transformative thing. Already signed up for the next class, which is Essential Earnest, which is starting in, what, a week and a half now. 
Um, and I'm also going to be doing the practitioner path starting in the fall. So it's just such a gift. So if you're thinking about it, don't hesitate. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Jan. Um, uh, Jen. <laughs> Jan. Uh, phew, that was wonderful. Yeah, she did a really lovely job, and I know it's been a, a tough morning for you. And I want to say that's what happens when you learn how to take these principles and bring the steps that you need that we take are putting one foot in front of the other. I don't know how I'm going to get to Mount Olympus. This is a famous Socrates quote. You know, the teacher said, how do you get to Mount Olympus? And Socrates simply said, make sure every step is in that direction. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and um, do what we do, and that is a spiritual mind treatment and affirmative prayer. This is where I speak uh, affirmative prayer in a format that allows my consciousness to be in alignment with the thing that makes the grass grow. <sighs> so join me in this centered place where there is power and peace and joy and love. where I know I am divinely connected with the one. That one beautiful, benevolent spirit, that creative life force that wants to experience itself by means of me. And so I speak this word for myself and for anyone within the sound of my voice, knowing that as we embrace our greater reality, our unified presence with spirit, that our minds are enlightened, that our ideas become actionable, that the things that are important to us, the things that we value become crystal clear. So I know for each one as we look at this idea of good to great to grand, that there is indeed a movement of mind, a movement of ideas, a movement of heart, opening itself to a greater expression. And I know that this greater expression is divinely ordained and individuated by the means of each one's consciousness that are so similar, so connected, and yet so diverse. And I celebrate that diversity, knowing that when there are 300 billion, 7 billion, 300 million people in the U.S., 7 billion people in the world, knowing that when we come to this place of self-actualization, of that deep self-love that is centered in a healthy understanding of ourself as God in form, that it cannot help but have a beautiful ripple effect. That it moves from deep within us seemingly outward, but all that's happening is resonance. And we are resonating with the truth of our being that shows up as the truth in someone else's being. And I know that this is indeed how we bubble up a world that works for all. And so I celebrate this philosophy. I celebrate this teaching. I celebrate this, this actualization of God in form as each one of us, knowing that that presence cannot help but be felt and expressed as we give ourselves away over and over and over again, knowing that we are simply that conduit of grace out in the world wherever we go. I give so much thanks for this knowing it is true, knowing that this is deeply steeped in principle, I simply surrender it, knowing it is done, and together we say, and so it is. <laughs>